Gung Hai Fat Choi, everyone. Welcome. I call this meeting of the Rotary Club of Oakland to order. I am Dudley Thompson and have the honor to serve as president of the Rotary Club of Oakland. Founded in 1908, we are the third established Rotary Club of some 36,000 clubs in over 200 countries around the world. We're a diverse community of some 270 local business professional and community leaders who unite to improve local and international communities through a common commitment of service above self. For over 113 years, we have welcomed Rotarians and guests to our club meetings, and I welcome you to this 5,373rd meeting. If you're a visiting Rotarian or the guest of a Rotarian, please enter your name in the chat box located in the, at the center of the bottom of the screen so that we can recognize you in a few minutes. If you have comments or want to ask a question of the speaker, please use the chat box. We recommend that you view today's meeting using speaker view located in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. For our thought for the day, I welcome Rotarian Ed Braille. Thank you, President Dudley, and hello, fellow Rotarians. Coming to you live from Chapel of the Chimes Funeral Home in Oakland, no pun intended there. Being from Chicago, Illinois, the land of Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln has always been a hero of mine. Today, I wanted to share just a few of his words of wisdom um, that he has given us during the tumultuous times of the Civil War. First one I'd like to share is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. Truer words never spoken. Um, another one, things may come to those who wait, but only the things that left by those who hustle. Another one is give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening the ax. <laughs> Another one I like, the best thing about the future is it comes only one day at a time. Great advice there. And the last one I wanna share with you, coming be, being a funeral director itself, and in the end, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, now I'd like to invite everyone to recite the Rotary Vision Statement with me. Sandeepa, could you bring it up, please? Together, we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. Our decision was to continue club meetings online through the month of February. We continue to plan club events and that are outdoors or in large indoor spaces. And you'll hear about some of those events, some of those projects and some of those events in our meeting today. Ed Jellen, are you out there? I am, President Dudley. Do we have any visitors today? Yes, we do. We have uh, two wonderful visitors that we're very happy to welcome. First of all, uh, Allison Bliss uh, has a guest with her. Her name is uh, Cheryl Fabio, and she is the director of uh, Ev Evolutionary Blues. So uh, welcome, Cheryl. And let's see if I can find anybody else out there. Oh, yeah. Ken uh, Richardson brought a guest with him. Uh, his name is uh, Peter Prevere, and he's a retired uh, accounting and finance professional who has served as director of the Berkeley Rep Theater and the Oakland Museum. And to boot, his uh, sister uh, Maude is a member of our club. So welcome, Peter. Love to have guests and uh, glad you could join us today. Yes, a special welcome to all of our guests today. Mary Gian. So, Mary, in a sense, you're a special guest today. Uh, Gung Hai Fat Choi to you. Uh, Mary's going to share a little bit about Lunar New Year. But Mary, uh, I'm sure 
almost everybody, certainly everybody in our club that's present knows Mary is our president elect for next year. And Mary will be the first Asian American president of the Rotary Club of Oakland. How does that feel, Mary? It's a very exciting time to go through. So I'm proud to serve. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of work, but I'm just, everybody said they would help. So I'm counting on them. Great. Mary, could you share a little bit about the history of Lunar New Year and what we're experiencing this, this week especially? Yes, I would be happy to. Um, we, I'm waiting for my PowerPoint to show up. Okay, great. So, Gong Hei Fa Choi, or Gan Si Fa Tai, which is in Mandarin, which Gong Hei Fa Choi is in Cantonese, which means may you be happy and prosperous. So Lunar New Year is the longest and most important celebration in Asia. With over 1.5 billion people across the globe celebrating the new year in China, Vietnam, Korea, Singapore for two weeks, similar to our Christmas holiday celebration for two weeks. But even during the Vietnam War, the Lunar New Year, which they call Tet, North and South Vietnamese forces would call a truce for three days to allow soldiers to return to their homes to celebrate with their families. So the Chinese year is 4,720, Year of the Tiger, which began on February 1st, 2022. The Chinese uses the lunar calendar, which has 13 months, which explain why Lunar New Year changes every year. So, as we know, the tiger is the third animal in the Chinese calendar 12-year cycle. Do you know how the animals got their order in the Chinese zodiac? Legend has it that in ancient time, Buddha asked all the animals to meet him on Chinese New Year, but only 12 animals came. In order to decide their order in the Chinese zodiac cycle, the animals held a very exciting race. The first one to cross the river will be granted the first year. The second to come in will be the second animal in the cycle and so on. The tiger being the king of the beast thought he had it made, but he didn't count on the strong hardworking ox to outpace him, similar to the bear and the turtle type scenario. And the tiger ended up third. The ox came in second, but then who was first? And how did that animal manage to surpass the hardworking ox and the vigorous tiger? Well, in the race, the strong hardworking ox was in the lead with the rat close by. Suddenly the so clever rat asked the good nature ox for a ride on his back. But then at the very last second before reaching the shore, the ungrateful rat jumped off the land to cross the finish line first to win the race. The ox came in second, the tiger third, and so it went. And the happy go luck pig took his time and came in last. And the Chinese zodiac and his 12 signs was born. Now, Buddha names a year after each animal and the cycle will repeat every 12 years. He announced that the people born in each year's animal's year will have some of the animal's characteristic. So people born in the year of the ox are active and energetic in work. They are bold to accept new things and decisive to take right action. They are fully devoted in careers and long for success. They enjoy a life of full challenge and unexpected events like visiting unusual places and meeting interesting and or outstanding people. Therefore, the most suitable jobs for them would be management, politician, actors, police, lawyers, entrepreneur, as well as adventurer. So famous tigers are say, said to be brave and confident, include poet Amanda Gorman, who turns 24, singer Lady Gaga, who will clock in at 36, and business magnate Sir Richard Branson, who will ring in at 72. So if you're a tiger this year, You'll be either age 12, 24, 36, 48, 60, 72, etc. So tigers, please raise your hand in the chat room. 
and identify yourself as a tiger. Next screen, please. So at Chinese New Year celebration, people wear red clothes, hence red jacket, decorate with poems on red paper, and give children and single people crispy lucky money in red umbrellas or hong bao, which you see in the upper left-hand corner. And keep in mind, must be crisp brand new bills. And red symbolize fire and good luck, which according to legends can drive away bad luck. The firework that shower the facilities also drive away evil spirits. Now, tangerines, orange, represent prosperity because of its golden color, like gold. Families would clean their house cut their hair, wear new clothes, visit each other, get together for dinner and exchange food gifts. Next slide. All right, people hang up beautiful red calendar with the Chinese character folk, which means prosperity. Dudley, can I call on you uh, to help me out? We have mm -hmm. three of these beautiful calendar to pass out to Rotarian. Could you pull three names from your lucky hat? Thank you, Mary. Yes, I do. I have it for everybody who signed up for the uh, bento box dinner tonight. I put their name in this uh, Chinese Stetson hat here, and I'm going to pull out the first name. So Key Norman is the first person. The second person who will get one is, uh, hold on here. Uh, Debo Sarkar gets a calendar. And the third person to get a calendar is Cynthia Harris. Wow, Cynthia. You know, I talked to Cynthia a couple months ago and when we, we were talking about the possibility of the Lunar New Year. And she that was the one event this year that she was really excited about staying, about being with us. And then we had to cancel it, but she did order dinner for tonight. Great, so. all right, thank you. All right, next slide. Okay, well, this is the year of the tiger on parade. So the canceled Chinese New Year parade in 2020 left San Francisco with a sudden invention that may end up being an enduring trans tradition. Lunar New Year zodiac statues installed throughout the city. In 2020, there were 10 life-size ox for the year of ox installed throughout San Francisco. So for the second year in a row, the San Francisco Chinese Chamber of Commerce commissioned a multi-artist Lunar New Year installation public art exhibition spanning all over San Francisco this year to ring in the Year of the Tiger. There are six life-size tigers publicly displayed around San Francisco from January 17th to February 19th to help ring in the New Year at and the tigers are located at San Francisco Chinatown Park, at the Asian Art Museum, they're at Chase Center, at Union Square, at Whole Food, at Stonestown, at Lucky Supermarket in Slope Boulevard. So happy tiger hunting, see if you can find them. And the statues spotlight local artists and as well as reflect upon the culture of people and traditions surrounding Chinese New Year. After February 19th, the six statues will be auctioned off and the proceeds will be added to the, um, be, uh, be spread out to nonprofits. And I'm happy to report that the Lunar New Year Parade will happen this year on February 19th at 6 p.m. in downtown San Francisco. And you can also watch it live on KTVU at 6 p.m. on TV. Okay, finally, Usually the Rotary Club celebrate Lunar New Year with a special dinner. Well, due to COVID-19, the Rotary Club is unable to come together to celebrate Lunar New Year tonight with our annual dinner. However, we came up with an alternative solution, a pre-order Japanese takeout bento box available for pickup tonight between 4.30 and 5.30 p.m. at the California Ballroom in front of the gate. And we also offer home delivery for those that requested it. So again, Gong Hei Fa Choi, and thank you for allowing me the time to tell you a little bit more about Lunar New Year. Thank you so much, Mary. 
and Dudley's Rotary Dash will be delivering those meals this afternoon to those who ordered it. Um, Nancy Williams, are you out there? Yes, I'm here, ready to go. So it's not only our Chinese celebration, but it's the beginning of Black History Month. And I we have a couple of events coming up. George is gonna tell us about one of them for next week, a little bit later, but you have a special event. And I see also a special guest out there today. Could you tell us a little bit about Evolutionary Blues? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the time to uh, talk about this great film. So again, happy Black History Month. While many of us celebrate Black history all year round, we're excited about all the great events that are happening in and around Oakland to celebrate the month our country has designated to promote and uplift African Americans and recognize our central role in U.S. history. In addition to the Color of Ballet panel discussion at next week's Civic Thursday meeting that Georgia will share more about a little bit later, we will be screening the documentary film Evolutionary Blues, West Oakland's Music Legacy on Thursday, February 24th at the Grand Lake Theater. This film can only be seen by checking it out from the Oakland Public Library, so you don't want to miss seeing it on the big screen uh, with uh, full sound with some great music. It, excuse me, it's your chance to see more than 30 artists who regularly played in clubs and music venues in West Oakland, sharing their stories. Doors will open at 6 p.m. with the film starting at 7, immediately following the screening. We're honored and our guest today to have the film's director, Cheryl Fabio, spend time with us on a short Q&A. We will be checking vaccination cards and practicing masking and social distancing so that everyone remains safe which means tickets are limited, so you should get them now. They are on sale at Eventbrite for $14. This is a family-friendly event, so please invite your friends, family, neighbors, and colleagues. Also consider inviting someone that would make a great member of our club. And in the spirit of giving back, if you know of a youth group or other organization that would enjoy learning more about blues music and its rich Oakland history, consider purchasing a group of tickets and inviting them as your guest. For group tickets, sales of 10 or more, please contact Jesse Bell. Lastly, please share the event on social media. Everything you need is posted on the Rotary Club of Oakland's Facebook page. Just hit the share button and we look forward to seeing everyone there. Thank you so much, Nancy. We really look forward to this and uh, you'll be hearing about it every week leading up to the 24th. And uh, we wanna sell, this is a, this is an event that our club is putting on, but it's open to the public and we wanna sell a lot of tickets for this. It's a great movie and uh, we really welcome people to come. Bring a friend. Um, Robert Kidd, are you out there? I am, thank you, President Dudley and gung hei fa choi to you. Uh, Rotarians, when we think of great hikes, epic hikes, we think of trails like the Appalachian Trail, the John Muir, the South Island of, of, of New Zealand. Uh, your High Adventure Committee is planning its own epic hike a little closer to home, along the crest of the East Bay Hills from Richmond in the north to Castro Valley in the south. Now, we're, we're not going to do this all in one, one, one event, one hike, but rather in four separate hikes. The first will be coming up on Sunday, February 27th through Wildcat Canyon Regional Park up uh, near Richmond. From Wildcat, we will hike through Tilden Re Regional Park in April, through Redwood Regional Park in June, and then Chabot Regional Park in August. And when we, re when we reach Lake Chabot in August, we will be among the few, the proud, who have walked all the way, more or less, from Richmond to Castro Valley. Within the next day or two, the first stage of the hike will appear on the Rotary Club calendar. Uh, we invite you to sign up. A hike through Wildcat Canyon Regional Park, Sunday, February 27th, and bring a friend. Thank you very much, Robert. That sounds great. And it's a great plan to have several events planned ahead of time so we can mark them on our calendars. Get some exercise and bring a friend. Um, a few other events that are coming up. Um, on February, oh gosh, off the top of my head, February 15th, on Tuesday, February 15th, we're having a golf tournament at Sequoia Country Club. Um, I tell many 
people, I, when I joined Rotary, I was very selfish. Um, one of the, my selfish reasons is I'm a public uh, daily fee golfer, but it was a chance to play some of the great private clubs around here. And Sequoia is one of those wonderful clubs where they used to play the Oakland Open. It's a, got a lot of history and you can sign up on the website. That's Tuesday, February 15th. Um, the second thing is uh, the district, uh, there we go, Sequoia. Uh, next is International Women's Day. Um, the district is holding a special event on uh, Sunday, March 13, uh, celebrating International Women's Day, which is earlier that week. Um, and uh, this, particularly the special guest speaker is the chief operating officer of Zoom. So if you're having problems with Zoom, maybe you can ask her a question and she can solve it for you. Um, and our Rotary Club has been asked to, uh, there, it's not a, a long event, it's I think three hours if I recall, uh, two and a half hours, but they do have a, a project fair table. And our club has been one of the six clubs that's been asked to uh, show, show off what we do here. Uh, the third thing is the district convention which is coming up April 22nd to the 24th. Uh, it begins at the Blackhawk Museum and then moves to the Marriott and San Ramon. Uh, they're still putting, putting together the program, but the first night is going to be a fundraiser uh, for the Maharaji uh, Peace Center. And it has a couple of very well-known uh, NBA players, um, which will be an interesting dinner event uh, for a fundraiser. Uh, the, and then we have the blood uh, donation. We've been talking about the last two uh, weeks. It's been, it's very important. There's a crisis uh, for blood out there. Uh, you can, if, if, you, if you're comfortable putting an app on your phone, put the Red Cross blood app. Um, it, it's a little bit hard to get an appointment right away uh, downtown Oakland, but I went on yesterday and I see there, there were like two appointments available that day, one of them out in, in Walnut Creek and uh, I can't remember, I think one was in Emeryville. So please sign up uh, to donate blood and if, uh, if you're on the app, you, you'll be able to say it's part of District 5170 or please let Jesse know uh, that you donated blood and, and we'll, uh, we'll keep track of folks. And the final thing is the online for the environment committee, we ask people to do the online survey for your carbon footprint and share that uh, uh, with Joel Parrott. Uh, and we're gonna, we won't talk about people individually, what your, what your footprint is, but we do wanna look at what our club's footprint is. And then we'll be working on that throughout the rest of this year. So those are a few upcoming events. Um, so Mary, could you please introduce our speaker for the day? Got Mary Jiang out there. No, Mary dropped off, I think. Okay, I got I got kicked out. <laughs> I'm back. I look, I, okay. There you go, Mary. Could you All introduce right. our speaker for the day? All right. So anyway, I'm pleased to welcome Jean Fauser, a professor of English and American Studies at the University of Delaware. She is the author of the acclaimed history, Driven Out, The Forgotten War Against Chinese Immigrants. Information about the book is in our chat room. In her book, Professor Fauser describes the violent ethnic cleansing that was directed at Chinese American in California and the Pacific Northwest from 1848 and into the turn of the 20th century and the formidable resistance it prompted in the courts and in the streets. This ethnic cleansing occurred not in faraway places, but in towns and mining camps familiar to all of us, places like Truckee and Eureka Santa Cruz and Los Angeles, and countless mining camps, lumber camps, and farms. During this Lunar New, Lunar New Year celebration, we celebrate the contributions of Chinese American to American life. We also remember the obstacles 
over which Chinese Americans has triumphed. To help us remember, please, let's welcome Professor Jean Felser. Thank you. I'm um, very honored to be speaking to Oakland Rotarians and the Bay Area is a huge part of my life. Um, I was born in LA, went to Berkeley for my BA and, and MA and then went overseas for my doctorate and came back and taught up here where I'm speaking from our cabin in Humboldt County. Um, and then I went from here to UC San Diego. And then I went to work for a member of Congress on labor and immigration and women's issues. And then um, to the University of Delaware where I teach in American studies and Asian studies. Today and this week is um, a really important week for um, Chinese Americans and Chinese American history and for all of us because the city of San Francisco joined four other cities to pass a resolution apologizing to the violence and racism and anti-Chinese hate that was, um, that was brought onto the first Chinese Americans who arrived in San Francisco with the gold rush in 1849 and has endured in our country um, up to the present waves of anti-Chinese hate of we remember the Asian woman 10 days ago who was pushed off the subway tracks in, um, in New York and then the women killed at the spa in Atlanta and how it took almost two weeks for us to learn their names and who they were. And there's been very little follow-up to that assault on these women. So I wanna to talk today about the history of Chinese Americans, especially in California. And I also really wanna focus on the incredible lesson Chinese ancestors have given us about resistance and how to fight back. And as I tell a really tough story, I think I like to keep in mind at least that Every time something came down on the Chinese American community, they fought back. That Chinese people are targeted because they're seen as docile or submissive. And this is just not an accurate portrayal of Chinese American history. So my rebel spirit can identify very strongly with the history I'm about to tell. And maybe give us some hope and ideas as we move through this very vexed time that we're living in. So I wish everybody gung hoi fet choi and from Eureka where we are working to and have put up a mural in honor of the history of the Chinese Americans in Eureka and two monuments because Eureka was one of the leading towns in purging Chinese Americans. And there's now a community of about 1600 Asian Americans who have come together to build the monuments and create the mural and sold out walking tours. And to me, I like to think about this in the context of the apology of how do we right the wrongs and how, and one of the biggest wrongs for Chinese Americans has been silenced. Um, of a history that's silenced or slotted into Asian American studies or Chinese American studies. And as yet is very thin in the, um, in the schools and even and marginalized in the universities as well. So our kids don't have this in their pocket going forward in understanding the world that we live in. I just want to speak to the resolution a little bit. Um, it apologizes on behalf of the Board of Supervisors of San Francisco to Chinese immigrants and their descendants for systemic and structural discrimination, acts of violence and atrocities, and 
the city is committed to the rectification and redress of past policies and misdeeds. And as I talk about what came down on the first Chinese Americans, I think it's in some ways the city handed me an outline for my talk, which is great, but also I think it's important for us to think about the many, many kinds of restitution and repair. Um, reparations comes from the word, the concept of justice that repairs. And part of it's financial, but part of it is educational, part of it is political, part of it happens in the law and in the courts and in the jobs and in the schools and in the music that we sing. So I hope we can hold in mind a very capacious idea of justice that repairs. Um, among the things that the apology cites is the 1860 um, California Education Code that prohibited Asian students from attending public schools with white kids, opening the segregated Chinese school in 1870, which lasted for 15 years. There were no public schools for Chinese kids. The Supreme Court decision, Tate versus Hurley, it was led by Chinese American family, Mamie Tate, um, who was so troubled by the treatment of her kids that she filed this winning lawsuit. And when the Smithsonian a few years ago celebrated Board V, um, the, the Board V, uh, Board V Education, um, the Kansas City School Board, um, famous act that opened public schools to all kids, that we were able to get the Smithsonian to include a big wall on the Mamie Tate case because it came ahead of Brown v. Board of Education. Um, and yet Chinese students in the Bay Area continued to attend or be forced into um, segregated Chinese schools. And as we think about the many kinds of discrimination that Chinese gongs were not allowed to be rung because they disturbed the peace, Chinese um, vegetable growers and many communities in California relied on Chinese vegetable growers for fresh food. They weren't allowed to carry to deliver food on poles that extended beyond their shoulders. Um, and so they limited the length of shoulder poles um, and it was ways of stopping Chinese economics and Chinese um, gardeners from delivering the foods. And, in effect, starving out the communities. And you weren't allowed to have a laundry in a wood building, but in Northern California, everything was built out of wood. So I'm gonna share my screen now with some images and I'm going to talk for the time I have through these images so that we can have a visual sense of what was going on. This is the, the, the pictogram, the ideogram that was painted for my book, Driven Out. And I think it speaks to the situation we're in today because everybody who looks at these has a different view of them. That's the beauty of this written language. But the one on to your left is to drive, to force, to push out. And the one on your right is more toward driven out. Um, the Chinese called the roundups, the purges, the pai hua. And the image on the right can look like a hand or a sword stopping the purges. I first heard about this story when I was finishing my dissertation, I got a one of those temporary adjunct replacement contingent jobs up at Humboldt State, which this week became the third polytechnic in California, Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, but at Humboldt State, 
I was in graduate school. I was broke. Um, I was living up in the little cluster of cabins where I am right now in Big Lagoon, north of the fishing village of Trinidad. And I would drive down to Humboldt State. Uh, our daughter was in the two room schoolhouse up the road. It's still up the road from us here. And I would drive to Humboldt State past the Red Room, through the Redwood Forest, through this incredibly majestic um, scenery and landscape and get to Humboldt State. And as I looked around, I didn't see any kids in any of my eight, first time teaching my eight new courses. And I started asking around, where are the Asian kids? I grew up in LA. This doesn't look like my world. And some people hadn't noticed. Somebody, you know, most people had no answer for me. And finally, a local poet said, well, Chinese families won't send their kids up to HSU because 100 years ago, they were rounded up and driven out of Eureka. And they do not feel this is a welcoming place for their kids. And a, it wasn't my area of research at the time. And, but I fell in love with this incredible um, scenery and place and friendliness and haunting beauty. And I began to sense that like in many places, there is violence buried right underneath this beauty. And I began to look for this story. And I began at the Bancroft Library thinking I was going to look for what happened in Eureka. And part of it was me paying back, paying my debt to this place I fell in love with. And my first day at the Bancroft, and that was when, you know, before the web, and I'm going through the reels and reels of microfilm, I found 80 roundups in California. And by the end of my research, I found there were over 240. And this is a map I made. It's the base map is from the Library of Congress. And these are all of the places where there were violent purges against the first Chinese Americans. And I know there are over 200 because I had to go to Office Depot and buy more red dots. And it's hard to see. So this is just a visceral image of the extent of the anti-Asian hate. Some of the questions that come to my mind as I talk about this research and, and driven out is I think about my own family's immigrant background. And except for those of us who are Native American, our ancestors all came from someone else. What made people move thousands of miles across seas or forced to come in slave ships? Why did people leave their families? Or in my father's case, um, his villages. Um, why did they leave the centuries of their faith, of um, a history of poverty, but a history of home? Um, what happened along the way? Where were the rebellions? Where were the slave revolts? What was their experience when they got here? Were they welcomed? And how do you know if you've been welcomed? I mean, the Rotarians are an incredibly welcoming community. How do people know when they've been welcomed? Are they given jobs? Are they given a sense of belonging, citizenship? Um, are they allowed to marry who they want? What did people think about when they came here? What were the Chinese Americans thinking when they came here? Did they plan to assimilate? Um, did they plan um, to go back and forth to China, which in fact is what they, they did do in some cases, like when the Irish migrated, there were rarely funds initially to go back and forth. In my family's case, um, they, they could not have gone back. Actually, it would have been to the Ukraine, to a little Jewish shtetl in the Ukraine. Um, 
there were 11 kids in my dad's family, seven of them were men, and they were being drafted into the Tsar's army, which for a Jewish family would have meant slavery and death. So they couldn't go back. And it was different. The Chinese people went back and forth and back and forth. And that transport got built into the anti-Chinese immigration laws. What was the loss of migrating? What did you lose when you lost your home country? And once you got here, were you excluded? Were you victimized? Were you lynched? Were you raped? Um, were you forced to wear ID cards? And we'll talk about the photo identity cards. And then what did you do? And all of us, and I certainly have learned so much from studying Chinese American history in terms of resistance. Um, they fought in the court to get naturalized. Um, a Chinese prostitute who was banned from entering the country fights her way um, to be heard before the Supreme Court. An unknown case, a woman named Chui Lai represents 22 other enslaved Chinese prostitutes. And she wins birthright in her case before the Supreme Court. She wins long before we know about it, the right for every child who was born in this country to citizenship. Um, they bought land. They fought like Mamie Tate into being allowed to go to the schools. Um, and they refused to leave. There were, the Chinese organized the first general strike in California. They insisted that the railroad when they came to work on the railroad, provide them with Chinese food. They went on an eight day strike to get equal pay with the Irish workers on the railroad. It's one of the first strikes for equal pay in American history. So I've learned a lot and I'm in deep honor of the Chinese American ancestors. But this is what happened to them. This is a placard that I found up in Crescent City, one of the northernmost coastal cities. And it says a mass meeting of the citizens of this place will be held on January 31st, that was 1886, to devise a lawful means of, reading, ridding, Cres of ridding Crescent City from the Chinese. The story of Chinese Americans is a gendered story. There's the men's story and the women's story. And there's the only way to tell it is really to tell it one at a time. The first Chinese men who came, came to um, pan for gold. They came like people from all over the world and people from the East Coast. And because in some ways it was easier to cross the Pacific than get across the country, they, the Chinese, the Chileans, the Mexicans, the Argentinians, were some of the first people into the gold mines and immediately they're driven out. One of the ways is that California passes the foreign miners license tax and it goes from $2 a month to $3 a month to $20 a month. It's a back, it's a back breaking tax and both true and fake Tax collectors are riding through the gold country. Sometimes they came with brass bands to tear up the Chinese mining camps, to drive them out, or to collect these fees, um, some of which were fake. And the Chinese found ways to notify each other and to hide so that they wouldn't be assaulted by these real and fake tax collectors. And finally, many of the Chinese miners came down from the mountains um, because the, it was a backbreaking tax and they go to live in the rural communities. And those are the beginnings of the many, many Chinatowns such as in Marysville, in Eureka, San Francisco, Sacramento, um, the first Chinatowns in California. The Chinese were harassed when they landed and they were accused of bringing opium into the country. This is from Harper's Magazine and both the men and the women were strip, strip searched at the dock looking for opium.
This was one of the sites of great violence. This is Los Angeles Chinatown in 1871. And it was built on top of um, the Latino community in downtown um, LA. It's very near where the train station is in downtown LA. And what happened in 1871 is there was a wedding. And it was a wedding between two groups of Chinese people who came from different areas, different communities, different merchant families. And there was a kerfluffle. But word goes out that, quote, there's a riot in LA's Chinatown. And white gangs, um, many who were um, ranchers and farm workers, come into this street, into downtown. Um, Chinatown, which was called the N-word alley. I don't want to say the word, but that was the name, the common name for LA's Chinatown. And they start to torch Chinatown and they lynch 17 men and two women. And this is one of the la largest mass lynchings in American history, happens in LA Chinatown in 1871. And there weren't gallows, but they were lynched from gate posts and from the arches over wagons um, and from the tops of buildings. And the riots lasted, the anti-Chinese riot lasted for a night. I got a phone call from a woman who said, you don't know me, but I have something I think you wanna see. This was a journalist's photo of the LA jail yard the morning after the lynching where the bodies have been cut down and the families are invited to come identify their relatives and collect their dead for burial. And in the 19th century Chinese tradition, part of the Chinese contract when they came here often borrowing money from the Chinese merchant families is that their bones would be returned to their village in China. And the tradition was it took seven to eight years. Um, and then the bones were dug up and returned to China. And the Chinese Railroad Workers Project at Stanford has done a lot um, to find the villages where the Chinese railroad workers were sent back to where their bones were sent back and buried. And there was a lot of racism around this burial practice as if other people's burial practices are any um, tidier, whether it's cremation and the idea of scraping the bones and sending them back after eight years um, was a, a way to target Chinese people as if there was something very different about their burial practices. If, if you want to go to one of the beautiful Chinese cemeteries, there's one up in Nevada City and it was preserved and it's very quiet. And you see the indentations where the graves were before the, the bones were sent back. And part of the Chinese tradition was that there was food both to be buried with the person and the feast that accompanied the ceremonies. And the entire cemetery is covered with Bing cherry trees that grew from the funeral celebrations and memorials there. So you can sit under these cherry trees and eat Bing cherries, which were invented you know, by a Chinese farmer and have a very quiet and serene afternoon um, up in Nevada City. This was Chinatown in Sacramento. Jean, I want to call your attention to time, especially if you want to take a couple of questions. So right. be aware. Yeah, I will. Um, I'm just going to run through these very quickly. This is Chinatown in San Jose. It was burned out five times and it was rebuilt um, the fifth time right in front of City Hall. And when the police tried to raid Chinatown. Um, the Chinese filed the first lawsuit in California against police harassment. 
This was Chinatown here in Eureka, and it was segregated. It was built around one square block. And when they drove out the Chinese in 24 hours, um, that they 600 men gathered in Centennial Hall to honor the centennial of the Declaration of Independence. The first move was to burn China, to murder the Chinese. It was a very Christian era, that didn't go over. The second was to burn Chinatown, but the Chinese weren't allowed to own property. Um, and the guy who owned Chinatown owned the stables. His name was Ricks. He said, no, don't burn Chinatown, it's mine. And so the compromise was to drive the Chinese out of Eureka in 24 hours. And they spend a weekend down at the wharf and leave, this was one of the two boats. And they end up on the Monday morning in San Francisco. And after this horrific and frightening weekend, they gather in Chinatown and they make a historic announcement. And they say, someone will have to pay for the damage done to us. And the Chinese from Eureka in Wing Hing, the, the city of Eureka, filed the first lawsuit for reparations in the United States. This was a boast um, to bring white immigrants into Eureka, the only county in the state containing no Chinamen. This was the vegetable poles that were banned. What the Chinese did in response was um, organize a food boycott up here in Eureka and in the mountain towns of the Sierra, refusing to deliver any food at all. This was a Chinese laundry that was banned um, because it was made out of wood. And what the Chinese did was return laundry dirty and unwashed in response. There were other plans. Um, this was from a children's parade up in the Siskiyous. Um, it's a little child's cap gun. And I just want to talk about the women's story very briefly. The men, Chinese men, chose to come here. They signed contracts. They were paid to work on the railroad or to pan for gold, which were the two big origin stories. The Chinese women did not choose to come here. The girls were kidnapped from the port cities in China and sold into prostitution, first in San Francisco, then in the gold fields and across rural towns in California. This is an image of a slave den in Mokulumne Hill um, for where Chinese girls were bought, quote, bought and sold. This was a Chinese prostitute up in Eureka. And this is not a typical immigrant pose. Um, it's a very, at the time, erotic pose. It's a studio photo. It was probably an ad to sell her. The chrysanthemums were a Chinese symbol for um, purity. And it may have been a signifier that they were promising to sell her virginity. She was atypical. You can see her feet were bound. Um, that would not have been true of a working class or peasant or poor girl because you couldn't walk. This was Jackson Street in San Francisco where the brothels, um, where the girls were kept in caged rooms to solicit um, customers and the door would be open. She would service the customer the madam who was Chinese would take the money and lock her up again. The, in 18, there are three laws to keep in mind. Um, 1875 is the Page Act and it bans lewd and debauched women from entering the country. That meant Chinese. The second one that we talk more about now is the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 which banned the return of people, of Chinese people who had formerly lived here or the entry of new Chinese workers. And the next one was 1892 and it was the Geary Act. And it was the first act in this country 
that required the Chinese people to carry a photo identity card on their person. And many Chinese people now carry these cards in honor of their ancestors, in honor of their history. And it's something we should think about now because this has come to haunt us. It was in the Patriot Act following 9-11 and all of those barcodes on our new driver's license. We have no idea what information is in those barcodes, but all of us now are required to have in effect photo identity cards in our new driver's license. I just wanna end, um, this is a picture of a salmon cannery. It's um, actually up in Seattle. And I think one of the groups of people who have not been thought well about during the pandemic are the people who garden and farm workers and cannery workers. And the machine, that round machine that you see in the background is called the iron sink. And it was to replace Chinese laborers with technology. The Chinese have come back, came back to Eureka in 1906 um, to work in a salmon cannery on the Eel River. But this time they refuse to leave until their contract is signed and they're kept on Dulawat and, or otherwise known as Indian Island in Humboldt Bay um, to wait for a ship to carry them back to Astoria, Oregon. But this time with great pride, they've refused to leave without their contract being paid. So this is the fastest <laughs> summary history of the Chinese. Um, and this is what San Francisco is apologizing for. Antioch, the little town of Antioch on the Delta has apologized there. What happened is that the town doctor says seven little white boys have contracted syphilis, their children, and their dads had taken them to Chinese pro um, prostitutes as some kind of Victorian initiation into their sexuality. And the syphilis is blamed on the Chinese prostitutes, not on the men who took the kids or also gave syphilis to their wives. And the Chinese prostitutes are driven out and are driven out from Antioch in one night and they come back. And Antioch was the first city in California to apologize for its treatment of the Chinese. So I'm gonna finish here and I'm open for questions and to bear in mind, how do we make whole? What kind of repair um, is appropriate as ethical and moral people? What is our duty to history? What do we do about the anti-Chinese hate that we're living in now? How do we use Lunar New Year's and the Year of the Tiger, which is a, a leader, a tough, a character not to be messed with? Um, how do we invite the tiger into our thinking to think about justice that repairs? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, for, uh, very difficult history, part of our history to hear. Uh, we don't have time for questions right now. Maybe Jean can stay um, after a few minutes after the meeting. Uh, it, normally we'd be in the ballroom and we, well, you'd be humble, so I guess you wouldn't be in the ballroom today anyway, but often our speakers can stay a few more minutes if people want to ask questions. I see Danielle Jiang had put a link. Cities with Historic Council of Racial Justice and also uh, Rachel Care in California. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. Um, th uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, this year we're highlighting the new Rotary area of focus, which is the environment. And for being with us today in your honor, we're making a donation to the Environmental Sustainability Rotary Action Group. <clears throat> As <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, SREG, towards their focus on biodiversity, sustainable living, pollution, 
the climate, food systems, and a circular economy. Thank you so much for being a part of our Civic Thursday club meeting. Um, there was a question that came up in chat uh, during the meeting about bento box. Uh, just most people did not sign up for home delivery. There were a few of you that did. Um, if you do want a home delivery, give Jesse a call. Uh, I'll be making those deliveries, glad to do it. Uh, don't hesitate, but uh, give Jesse a call. If you didn't sign up, please pick them up at the Rotary office. Georgia Richardson, we have a great program next week. Would you tell us a little bit about it, please? Absolutely. Thank you, President Dudley. Um, being sensitive to time, I'll breeze through this the best I can. It's, I'm honored. It's a great program. Let us know. Yeah. <laughs> I am honored and excited to announce that our Black History Month featured panel speakers for, the, for next week will feature ballerina Angela Watson, who is currently a member of the San Francisco Ballet Company. She will be joined by Reginald Ray Savage, the director of Savage Jazz Studio, and Carlia Shelton Benjamin, who's a former principal ballerina of Dance Theater of Harlem. They will be interviewed by Angela's ballet mom, Carolyn Evans Watson. We are looking forward to hearing from Angela firsthand about her journey as a ballerina, Carolyn's journey as a ballerina mom, and will receive rich history of Blacks in the world of ballet. We invite you to join us next week in honor of Black History Month. And a special thanks to Nancy Williams for contributing the marketing assets for both of our Black History events that we are working on. Thank, Thank you, you, Georgia. Um, Sandeepa, I didn't see any bell ringers out there. Did you catch any? I don't hear any. Uh, if we there's, did, there's three bell ringers. Okay, it's Jesse. Linda Chu rang the bell for Mary's uh, Young. And, Moment, uh, I, I'm sorry, who was that? Linda Chu. Chu. Linda Chu. Thank you, Linda. Lois Corin ran the bell twice, once for Mary and once for Cheryl, the director of the uh, Evolutionary Blues. Thank you, Lois. Uh, for those of you that are new, a bell ringer is a generous $100 donation to the Oakland Rotary Endowment. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Thank you, Ed Braille, for giving us the words of wisdom of Abraham Lincoln past president, past district governor, Ed Jellin, with always proper due respect, sir, um, for welcoming guests, Mary Jiang, thank you so much. Uh, uh, president elect Mary Jiang with proper and due respect. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us the history of Lunar New Year and for introducing our speaker. Uh, Nancy, thank you so much for the, uh, telling us about the evolutionary blues and, uh, and then Robert Kidd for the upcoming hikes. Dr. Feltzer for being with us today. That was a very important lesson for us. And please stay a few more minutes afterwards. And Georgia, thank you for sharing about next week. And our AV team, thank you for Peter Sherris and especially Sandeepa Nayak for running the AV show today. I wanna to thank everybody for joining us today. Remember, we are Rotary, serve to change lives and don't keep Rotary a secret. This meeting of the Rotary Club of Oakland is adjourned. What a great presentation. Fantastic presentation. There we go. Dean, you muted.